Alrighty, so today on the Cosmic Keys podcast, I'm speaking with one of my favorite Instagram accounts. <laughs> the account that I'm referring to is called Symbolic Studies, and I'm here today with Mario Garza, who's the creator of it. Symbolic Studies, his page, um, has put out a lot of really great, like, narrated content with really good artwork to accompany it. And it covers a lot of like the esoteric symbolism of the tarot, of the zodiac, of the Bible, of a lot of kind of, I want to say just like primordial um, esoteric information. So I'm really excited to talk about this stuff with Mario today. So welcome to Cosmic Keys, Mario. Thanks for being here. Hey there. Thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. You've interviewed a lot of really quality people, and uh, I've checked out your stuff off and on over time, and we have some mutual friends too, so this is a pleasure to be here and chat with you. Yeah, definitely. It, it's cool. With your account, I think I just kind of, I don't know how long ago I started following it or if I just stumbled upon it, but um, I feel like it, I've been seeing it more lately and I've been really impressed by it. And then I see you connecting on other podcasts too. So it seems just kind of like an organic um, growth that you've got. And really the content is top notch and it's really, um, I think my favorite thing about it is like the accompaniment of like the really good art and um, really good, strong information and explanations on, you know, you're talking a lot about, certain things in the Masonic artwork from all these like old Masonic texts connecting to the Zodiac or connecting to the tarot or connecting to different things in the Bible. So, um, yeah, I, I, for anyone listening, I definitely recommend it. But, um, for those of us that don't really know about your background, could you give us like a little bit about your bio and how you got on this path of studying the symbolism of, you know, all these esoteric topics? Yeah, for sure. And thanks for saying all of that. And once I give you my bio, you'll understand why my channel is kind of the way it is, right? But uh, I've always been artistic. And so as a child, I would draw quite a bit. And I've always been interested in magic, like stage magic, you know, and I can really acknowledge that and see that now in hindsight, you know. I was really into like David Copperfield and whenever there was anything on TV that had to do with magic, I was just always fascinated with it. Um, I remember seeing a Zodiac wheel, now that I think about it, when I was really young too. And that was kind of interesting to me. I didn't really quite understand what it was, but there was something intriguing there. And I was just always artistic. And um, in high school, I started using Photoshop and I was probably 16 when I first got my uh, copy of Photoshop. And I started just messing around with Photoshop and creating different designs and whatnot. And my first sort of exploration into design was actually through like the hardcore and punk and metal scene in Central California. And so I started doing a lot of flyers and t-shirts for friends bands. And um, you know, some of the local venues would hit me up for flyers and whatever. And so I was going to all these shows, eventually that would kind of transition into me doing album artwork and uh, a lot of merchandise too for a lot of these types of bands. So I've done work for a lot of random bands over the years and um, some of them have gotten fairly popular and huge. And at some point I just really kind of like dedicated myself to design. And so um, I've had basically 20 plus years of like refining my designer's eye and just really analyzing like iconography and photography and things like that because it was my bread and butter, you know? So I was really used to going through archives and looking for the right photos or looking for the right texture, the right color, the right clip art, you know, things like that. And pretty early on, um, in my life, I created a website that actually blew up kind of out of nowhere. I was like 21 years old. And uh, that allowed me to get an office space. I started screen printing. And so I started selling merchandise for the website. And this allowed me to uh, screen print for some of my design clients at the time. And uh, eventually, I kind of found out that, you know, 
that whole setup really wasn't my thing anymore. So I decided to pursue uh, going to film school. And so I moved up to the Pacific Northwest and I went to a really small film school in Portland, Oregon. And if there was one director uh, or even film that influenced me, it was Stanley Kubrick. And so when I got exposed to Stanley Kubrick, I was like, this guy's eye is like incredible. And just everything uh, about his films, you know, the cinematography, uh, you know, the scripts that he would choose, just the quality of everything, you know, it just really spoke to me. So I went to film school for a while and I realized that I really, really loved analyzing and breaking down film. It was like one of my favorite things, even my friends' projects, you know, uh, student projects. I just loved like analyzing what they were doing. And I started noticing patterns too, between people's short films of like, oh, this guy always likes to show food or someone cooking. And this person likes to show this or that or whatever. And this is stuff that they didn't even realize. And so I kind of realized that I had a knack for breaking down things symbolically. And at a certain point, um, you know, I decided that film school wasn't for me either. Um, kind of paralleling that in a way, I was uh, the art director for a design agency. So I've always done design work for the last like 20 years. And so I continued to refine my eye. I kind of created a few like art installations throughout that time too. Um, and it wasn't until someone that I knew approached me to create a website for them did I really start getting into the tarot. So uh, one of my buddies uh, had programmed a tarot website. I think it's like the biggest tarot website like around actually. And he programmed the little engine that creates readings for people. And he was convinced that he could program another engine and do a better job this time. And we can create this tarot website. And he basically said, you know, if we do this, then you should probably know a little bit about the cards. And so he bought a bunch of books about the tarot. He let me borrow a few. And I thought I understood symbolism, but then once I started looking into the tarot, I was like, oh man, I don't really know anything. And so it really just blew me wide open. And then, you know, I got my first deck, which was the Thoth deck, Aleister Crowley's deck. And then I started realizing that there's a correspondence with the tarot and astrology and numerology and psychology and mythology and color theory and all these different things, you know. And so it was just kind of off to the races from there. And then at a certain point, I realized that I just was accumulating so much information that I felt like I was actually, um, you know, not using that information wisely personally that I needed to integrate it and actually do something with it, but that I also needed to kind of push it out to and start letting people know what I was understanding and whatnot. And so that's how symbolic studies essentially was born. Nice. So how long ago was that when you first got introduced to the tarot? Yeah, so I would say probably like seven years ago or so, maybe eight years ago, something like that. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of the uh, esoteric experimentation with with a lot of people really were with within like the past ten years or so. Like, I feel like there's was definitely an explosion of interest in that, and the internet definitely helped that out too. Um, for sure absolutely and then how long what how long ago did you start um symbolic studies the the page so uh october 2020 was my first upload and so what i did was i kind of experimented for scorpio october 2020 and um i did a series of videos then and then i took a break i don't think i was qu quite ready just to commit to doing that you know mm -hmm. um and so i stopped until Aries 2021. So it's been a little over a year since I started producing content pretty much routinely, regularly. Yeah, and then it definitely. was a few months ago that I actually went full time with everything. Nice. Yeah. And so um, at that time where you were kind of first getting introduced to tarot and first starting to explore, what were some of like the early um, books or influences that that really resonated with you in that early period that we're talking about yeah sure um like i said i got the thought deck from crowley and that was a huge revelation i didn't even know that it was like a significant deck to a lot of people and so i just went to uh, a store locally actually we have a huge huge used bookstore called powell's and so they have a ton of books a ton of decks and everything else 
And um, the first book that I opened up was using that artwork as their uh, preview art and as their example art. And so I figured I would just get that. And as I started looking through it, you know, I was like, whoa, this deck is actually pretty deep. There's a lot of stuff going on here. So I bought the uh, Book of Thoth, the companion book. So that was a pretty big influence. And then I found out too that Jodorowsky, you know, the director, he released his own version of the Marseille deck and then he put out a companion book as well. And so I would say that those two figures were definitely uh, major influences on me. There's other uh, people like Barbara Walker. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work, but she's an amazing symbologist. And she put out a series of uh, symbolism books that are fantastic. I recommend them to anybody. And she also put out a deck too. And so she really bridged the gap um, with mythology. And so in a lot of her uh, references, she references uh, mythology, you know, how it relates to these tarot cards and whatnot. So uh, I would say those three people were, were pretty big influences on me early on for sure. Nice. Yeah. Um, this show, uh, I kind of, well, I started it with like a, a co-host and she would do tarot card pulls for the week ahead and I would do astrology for the week ahead. Nice. So tarot was really a foundational um, thing that this show is kind of all about. And I still, I, I kind of feel like I went through my tarot. I don't want to call it a phase, but where I was like using it more and I never really read for people too much, but I feel like once you get to the point where you actually like just know every every card is like up here and you can kind of just spit spit out the the definition or the meaning then I feel like it's kind of with you and then you're kind of it, it's it's almost like that's like the entire goal is just to uh, to have all of that upstairs <laughs> and then it, the archetypes just become familiar with you and they don't really leave you you're just kind of with them and you recognize them everywhere and out in the world for sure yeah i have a similar sort of relationship with it uh, i feel this way about astrology tarot pretty much any divination system that i've gotten into and i would say that those are the biggest that you know with tarot i was more interested in the information in the system itself than actually doing readings for myself or for other people mm -hmm. so i spent a really really long time just trying to understand you know, uh, these different patterns, you know, what all it encodes, you know, as many secrets as I could wrap my head around, you know, and it wasn't until a bit later did I actually start using it for reading purposes. And same thing with astrology too, uh, with my channel, I get so much out of trying to understand the archetypal, you know, symbolic value of the signs that I have yet to really truly uh, dip my toes into, you know, reading charts as an example, you know, but even as I just follow the signs, I get so much out of it that I almost feel like I don't need that quite yet, but I understand, you know, the importance and the value of all of that. And so that's generally my approach with most of these systems is that uh, the divination aspect of it is really crucial and important and I respect it. But uh, I also get just a ton out of trying to understand, you know, what patterns they're putting out there and everything. Yeah. And, and um, given the fact that you are uh, a professional reader with tarot doing it, doing it at this point, what's your um, take on how this type of divination works? Like, what do you, do you think that, um, or I guess my question is, what do you think is the metaphysical explanation for why it works or, or do you have any theories or thoughts about what is causing the readings to be accurate or the readings to actually be communicating truth? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I really think that the subject or concept of ether as just a thing is something that um, has been pretty much erased from history in a lot of ways. You know, it's this idea that there is this substance, you know, some people call it ether, sometimes I call it spirit. I'm actually starting to think that Mercury uh, <laughs> symbolically is just another metaphor for this energy, you know, that permeates everything. And so I think that there is, you know, we live in a, um, in a space that is pretty much quantum, if you want to put it that way too, where truly everything is connected and everything comes from the same source and returns from the same source. And so I think that that has an aspect um, 
to do with how divination ultimately works, you know? And I think that um, this isn't something clearly that we're taught uh, in school, you know, but there was an understanding of ether and ether kind of physics and how it works and everything else. Um, you know, a lot of different groups have called it by different names too. So some groups used to call it Vril. Um, my understanding too is that there are certain groups that um, as an example, like if you're doing voodoo, voodoo is just another word potentially just for ether or spirit. You know, I've heard yeah. that there's other, you know, black magical groups. They refer to it as Satan, you know, and it's basically, it's the thing between everything. So, you know, and that's really where the power is at. You know, if you look into physics, you know, uh, it's a pretty classic uh, sort of example now, but you know, most everything is kind of full of empty space. So ether would be the thing that fills that empty space, you know, uh, in Star Wars, they call it the force, right? And so it's just this life force energy that exists. And so uh, everything just is more connected than what you would expect. And uh, I do, you know, believe that there is something to divine timing and everything else. And that, you know, um, that there's meaning behind everything, essentially. So if you happen, you know, to drop a card on the ground, you know, and you flip it over and you look at it, you know, there's probably uh, meaning behind that. And so this is all part of how synchronicity works, right? It's almost kind of like if you have the eyes to see it or understand it. Uh, the funny thing, though, is, too, I think that you could be too open as well to these synchronicities and to these patterns and so i've known a lot of people over the years where i almost feel like they need to turn it down a hair because it completely like uh it's overridden some other aspect of themselves and i think that you could actually get too caught up in it sometimes so i think that uh, discernment has a lot to play um when kind of trying to figure out you know if something that presents itself has like this deep significant meaning or not and i can't really tell you either which way uh, you know it's almost like a feeling sort of thing as well right yeah i mean that's the thing about divination um i mean i'm more just an astrologer these days and from that point of view it's it's kind of like um you can be a little detached because the star the planets are going to move the way they're going to move no matter what you do yeah. And um, if you become obsessive about things or just like very focused, then you're like helping to kind of create the, uh, the outcome that you may be dreading or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing with divination is like, there have been times, whether it's tarot or really any type of like hands-on divination that I've worked with where you get the goosebumps and you're like, this is like the message. Yeah. And then there's other times where you're kind of like cracked out, not, like cracked out's a bad word for it. <laughs> but when you're just like desperate and like trying to get an answer. And yeah. then it's, it, there, there's definitely like varying levels of effectiveness. And I think when you pay somebody and make an appointment and have them do it, then it's a little bit, more significant than where like you have your tarot cards on your desk and you're like i always would say like do i go to panera or chipotle or you're like if you're pulling cards for stuff like that then yeah. that's a little schizo but um it's it's definitely <laughs> interesting that sometimes it really feels like it's like the, that is the message that's what you need to know it's like a resonance or when you're just like overusing it or overdoing it Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I've definitely felt both ways, obviously. And so I'm more of a person now where when I feel like it doesn't resonate, I almost feel like it might be my conscious mind, just not seeing the true connections or that maybe this, uh, the pattern will be revealed to me at a later time or something to that effect. And so I'm more a believer in the system and thinking that there's something, there's a user error kind of going on versus like the card isn't what's really going on right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about in both the case of astrology and tarot, um, how there's, they're kind of, all encompassing mm. like do you have the idea that like the zodiac should contain everything conceivable and categorize it into everything conceivable as well as you could say the same thing about the tarot like there's a tarot card for e every situation or anything do you have any thoughts about how they're both all encompassing like that 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say that any good system kind of has that baked in. So any good divination system, so the I Ching, you know, uh, there are 64 hexagrams. And so I would say that the 64 hexagrams do the exact same thing, that everything is kind of built into it. Um, even if you take like the four elements, you know, and then the fifth element being spirit or ether or what have you, you know, I think the same sort of thing could be applied there. Everything is just seemingly perhaps just a mixture of these four or five energies. And so I think that works the same way with a, um, you know, 12 sign Zodiac. I think the 13 sign Zodiac does that in a different way as well. A Fucus kind of being this completion, this 13th sign sort of thing. I'm not really dogmatic with any of these systems. I'm more of a syncretist where I try and, you know, understand as much as I can about all of them and see what makes sense, you know? Um, but yeah, for sure. And then same thing with the Zodiac cards. Yeah, it makes sense to me that it does kind of include everything. Uh, the fascinating thing though, since we're kind of talking about this, is I've noticed that there's a lack of understanding about something that I feel like is really significant to both systems <clears throat> that's really little understood uh, to a lot of people. And this has to do with the significance of the North Star. And uh, it's also known as the Pole Star or Polaris. But if you look up in the night sky, there's one star that all of the other stars revolve around. And this is the North Star. And so uh, this star, symbolic of so many different things, uh, it truly blows my mind. It's really been a game changer uh, with my understanding of symbolism. And so um, I think that there's a North Star aspect to the tarot. As an example, I think the star in the star card actually is a direct reference to the North Star. So I call it the star of stars for a lot of different reasons. And then also with the Zodiac too, uh, you know, uh, the North Star is in the center of the wheel of heaven, essentially. So you could see why that would be important in kind of relating perhaps its significance, you know, with the wheel of the Zodiac, because in a lot of ways, it's like the hub or the axle of that great wheel. And so that's something that I thought was really interesting over the last few years is just wrapping my head around the symbolism of the North Star how it relates to the North Pole and the Northern Lights, how it relates to Ursa Major and Minor, which are the Great Bear and Little Bear, how a lot of ancient cultures have revered the North Star, how it's been baked into a lot of myths, and actually how there's a lot of myths that um, are commonly attributed, say, to solar symbolism, but in actuality, it's polar symbolism. It has to do with the Pole Star, the North Pole and, and, um, and Polaris. Yeah, could you give some examples of the symbolic representations of the North Star, the Pole Star? Because I'm not, nothing is really coming to mind that I even know about. Oh, yeah. So as an example, I mean, once I started getting into this, my awareness of this came around probably maybe like five years ago or six years ago. I started hearing a little bit more about it. And then um, through a series of events, I really, really got interested in it. And then there's a few books that I received that really blew me wide open with North Star symbolism. And I started realizing how important it was. And uh, just very quickly, I'll say that um, I have a friend who's a symbologist. He has been for decades and decades. And I started telling him about some of the stuff I was figuring out with the North Star. And he was backing it up. He was saying like, oh yeah, exactly. You're totally right. I'm glad you finally came to this level of this understanding because it really is a big deal and it's little known and understood. But essentially what a lot of people consider to be, what a lot of groups around the world have considered to be their supreme deity lives and exists at the North uh, in the Northern sky. So literally the throne of God exists in the Northern sky. The North star has been equated with um, a godlike presence or a goddess like presence. So it's been both masculine and feminine. It's uh, been attributed to, uh, you know, the symbolic location of heaven. So uh, this whole idea of a stairway to heaven is actually a real thing. And it's, because people believe that we literally come from the northern sky and return to the northern sky. And so there are, as an example, there's some Freemasonic lodges. I know there's one specifically that I'm thinking of in London. On the top of the roof of their lodge, uh, they have this gigantic star. And around the star, they have the 12 signs of the zodiac. And then they have a ladder going to that star. 
And so this idea of a ladder to heaven, stairway to heaven, you know, it all goes to the North Star. And so there's a lot of different myths from around the world about seven sages or a, um, a deity that bestows knowledge and wisdom on the people coming from the North. Um, you know, when you see, as an example, the pole, the caduceus, and it's twin serpents going up the caduceus pole, and there's a little bulb up top and there's wings, you know, my personal interpretation of that is that what you're actually referencing is the North Pole. So the ancients had this idea that there is this symbolic pole from the North that extends into the heavens and goes to the North Star. And this was called the Axis Mundi. It's also called the World Axis or the World Pole. So this is what people talk about when we're referring to a world tree. So the world tree, that central trunk is the Axis Mundi. And so uh, Hermes, Thoth, Mercury, he goes up and down this pole, pillar, or post, and that's how he goes between realms, is through this axis mundi, through this world uh, pillar, essentially. And so this has been a thing that has been baked in and encoded in like so many different ways, it's insane. Um, a lot of the symbolism that's attributed to the northern sky has to do with the fact that Ursa Major and Minor revolve closely around the North Star. And so these two constellations are known as circumpolar, meaning that they don't dip below the horizon like the Zodiac does. And so mm -hmm. as an example, I'm sure, obviously, same case with you, but we can't see the full wheel of the Zodiac, you know, at one time, you know, it doesn't work that way. And so it dips below the horizon. So you can only see, you know, essentially the opposing signs of the sign we're in, you know, at night, right? And uh, Ursa Major and Minor, they're circumpolar. So you can actually see either the whole thing or the vast majority of these two constellations. And so these two constellations have seven stars apiece. And so uh, a lot of symbolism related to uh, Northern symbolism has to do with the number seven. So as I said, uh, like in uh, Vedic mythology, they have the Rishis. It's seven sages that come from the Northern sky and return to the Northern sky. And so this is symbolic of the seven stars of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Um, Ursa Major and Minor, they used to be referred to as wagons or wheels or plows, uh, sometimes chariots, um, sometimes the, uh, the bull of the, th uh, the thigh of a bull, you know. So in ancient Egypt, they referred to Ursa Major as the bull's thigh, as an example. Uh, the North Star has been compared to Odin's eye, uh, the eye of God. You know, so um, it has this um, kind of, what's the word am I looking for? Um, ever present sort of connotation to it because it's always there and everything revolves around it. And so it, it doesn't move, you know? So if you look at it night after night, it doesn't move. And so this is why too, way back in the day, if you were a sailor, you know, the North Star was the guiding star. That's the other name for it. Because if you were lost at sea, and let's just say your instrumentation was lost or whatever, you know, you could still find your way home by following the North Star. And so the North Star is the guiding star. Um, it's now the church attributes it to Mary. So she's referred to sometimes as um, Stella Maris um, or uh, Virgin Mary Star of the Sea or Stella Maris. This is a direct reference to the North Star. Um, the chariot card, yeah, I think has a lot of North Star symbolism baked into it. So it's number seven. This gets into this whole idea that uh, when you start reading about Ascension material, there's a lot of groups around the world that have had different methods of ascending to the other side using seven steps or seven phases. And this appears to be a universal thing. And so I really uh, appreciate this book that I read called Stairway to Heaven by Peter Lavenda. And he goes through this. So he goes through, you know, um, these Chinese traditions where they uh, walk through this seven stationed ritual to ascend to the other side. And as they were walking through these seven steps, they were directly referencing one star uh, per step of Ursa Major and they corresponded each star to the seven traditional planets as well. So the first star would be symbolic of the moon, and then you would go through these seven steps. Uh, he goes through esoteric Jewish traditions that basically have a very similar sort of thing where you're going through seven steps or phases on your personal chariot. This is called uh, Merkaba mysticism, 
to go to the other side. And uh, it just seemingly there's a lot of different groups, including some black magical occult groups that are well aware of this. So it seems to me that the North Star and the Northern Sky and the North Pole, which is essentially uh, the opening of a cusp of our electromagnetic spectrum, which is why there's the Northern Lights, that the North Star and Northern symbolism is also symbolic of a gateway that people have used to go to other places. Um, the same way that when people die, supposedly they go to the Northern Sky. So when people transition to go to the other side, uh, you know, a psychopomp traditionally is what would be considered the guide of souls. So, you know, you're taken on this journey to go to the other side. Well, symbolically, from everything that I've looked into, you actually go to the north. That's part of the deal. Um, I'm not sure if you've read the Box Saga or have you gotten into the Box Saga material by chance? I've, I've heard it talked about on other podcasts, but that, that involves the North Pole too, right? Because didn't they, doesn't that make the claim that the North Pole was moved or something? Like it wasn't yeah. always in the same spot? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's a whole conversation too about when we talk about polar shift, pole shift, like what does that actually mean? And there's a few theories out there. Uh, personally, I'm not committed to any of them. I'm still wrapping my head around that. And there's other people who think that pole shift is like impossible, you know? So that's still something that I want to do more research on. But uh, yes, they're very explicit with their Northern symbolism. And so they say literally, cause I'm like halfway through reading it right now, but they say that, you know, when you die, you ride your last breath to the North essentially. And so um, they even think that the, you know, the lowercase I, uh, that the dot on top of the lowercase I is symbolic of the North star. And then uh, the line is symbolic of the axis mundi of the world pillar. So, you know, um, I think probably one of the best examples to show people like the significance of this stuff and how it's baked into our culture, actually, but it's a little known unless you really look into it, um, is, is Christmas and the symbolism of Christmas, you know. So where does Santa come from? He comes from the North Pole. You know, to a lot of people who aren't even religious or spiritual, Santa might as well be the closest thing to a God that they have, to be honest, you know, symbolically, you know, and I'm not saying that it's like justified or it makes sense or it's not distorted or anything like that. But I'm just saying that like to, you know, a lot of children and to a lot of people, the way they look at Christmas and the way they look at the symbolism of Christmas, you know, it is like their premier holiday, you know, of the year. And so Santa comes from the north. And uh, what do we do? We chop down trees. This is symbolic of the world tree. And it's a very uh, specific type of tree. You know, we're not just using any old tree. But uh, we have these trees and we bring them into our home. And we put a star on top of the tree. Well, this is symbolic of the North Star. So really what you're seeing during Christmas is you're seeing a lot of northern symbolism. But you just would really wouldn't know it unless you started looking into it um, through this lens, you know. So it's been a real game changer for me. There's a lot of little threads that we can pull at. If there's any aspect of this stuff that you wanted to expand on, that's totally cool because um, I feel as though it's kind of at least it's kind of opened up like a personal positive Pandora's box. Honestly, it's just like blew me wide open. And so I'm happy to talk about any any aspect you might need clarity on. Yeah, well, the, the first thing that comes to mind, I don't know um, if you're familiar with Nick Hinton. No, I don't think so. So Nick Hinton wrote um, the Saturn Time Cube simulation book. He, he, he wrote a lot about, um, he had these two books that were very kind of conspiracy-ish. And um, anyways, he talked about Saturn and time and kind of the matrix and simulation and stuff like that. But I've heard him on other podcasts and it's, I, I, the only reason I bring this up is because it's what just first came to mind. But I thought he was saying basically what you were saying about the North Star. I thought he was saying it about Sirius. I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah. on that. Like, do some people claim that, you know, and it was mainly the Masonic thing because I think I've heard heard him briefly talk about it where he was saying the masons he said the same thing stairway to heaven but he was saying serious and i'm really not like i'm an i'm an astrologer but that's like the 12 zodiac signs and i really don't know but do you do you have any thoughts on that just that um i do serious is considered too 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. So this is just my personal opinion. Instead of trying to tiptoe around it, I'll just tell you honestly how I feel about everything. This is my very, very strong hunch. My strong hunch is that Northern symbolism, including the North Star and everything it represents, has been uh, obfuscated. And I think it's been intentionally buried because its symbolism is really powerful because there's actually an as above, so below, as within, so without correspondence. So when I refer to the Northern sky, I'm referring to a physical location, but I'm also referring to this, um, for the lack of a better word or a better way of putting it, I'm referring to the sacred center concept. And there's a sacred center within you as well. So the northern sky, the north star, yes, there is a physical external correspondence, but this also is a reference to your internal north star. And since it seems like we come from this area of the night sky and return to it, to me, it makes sense that everything has been patterned off of this design. So as an example, every tree is symbolic of a world tree. So the trunk of the tree is symbolic of that axis mundi. It's symbolic of that stairway to heaven or pillar or pole or post, right? Um, And so to me, the Northern symbolism is very, very holistic when you start looking at it that way. And it's really done a lot for me personally on like a spiritual growth level, psychological, emotional level as well. Um, But it's really fascinating. So as I've started looking into all of this stuff, I'm noticing that a lot of people say the exact same thing that I'm saying, and they usually attribute it to two other things in the sky. One is Sirius, as you've just mentioned, and the other is actually the Pleiades, which is just Mm -hmm. above Taurus. So the Pleiades has seven stars. It's known as the Seven Sisters. It's a beautiful constellation. I think it's amazing. I've seen people give whole presentations about how we come from the Pleiades, we return to the Pleiades, it's the origin of humanity, um, you know, that we should be speaking to the Pleiadians and that they're kind of like our ancestors or something to that effect. And a lot of groups are really into that. There's a lot of people in the new age community that are really into Pleiadian information. And I think it's fascinating, but when you look at it from a holistic perspective of where these constellations are, of where the North Star is, of the symbolism that's even overlapping between the two, like bull symbolism. There's an amazing amount of bull symbolism baked into Northern symbolism as well. It's really, it, it kind of sounds strange, but um, it's the center of the Taurus field, Taurus, Taurus field, right? Um, and then, like I said, the Egyptians refer to Ursa Major as the thigh of a bull. There's uh, different works of art where they're literally holding bull's thighs with seven stars within it. You know, if you were looking at it from the pleading perspective, you might think that this is just a pleading reference because it's right next to Taurus, but uh, it's actually a North Star sort of reference. Mm -hmm. And so when I see people referencing Sirius this way or the Pleiades this way, personally, I think that they actually have the symbolism kind of flipped a little bit. I think it's actually what you're referring to is Northern symbolism. And I don't know if it's part of a larger long-term agenda to have people be confused on like what's happening up there. But that's kind of my personal stance. I think that a lot of North star symbolism has been flipped and now a lot of it's attributed to the sun solar symbolism. So Mm -hmm. uh, this is a whole thing as well about, um, you know, this lost identification of certain gods actually being polar deities and not solar deities, meaning that they're a reference to the Northern sky. Uh, like this god named Pata, you know, there's this fantastic book that I read by this fellow named John O'Neill. He wrote it in the 1800s and he went all in on all of this stuff. And he basically said like from the sword to the spear, to the pole, to the post, to the pillar, it's all Northern symbolism. The, the world mountain, the world tree, it's all Northern symbolism. The Holy Grail, it's all Northern symbolism. This is what it's referencing. The, uh, the philosopher's stone, you know, it's just, it's all over the place. This is what they're really referencing is this uh, sacred center concept. And so he was saying that, you know, there's certain gods like Ptah, you know, he, he's holding this staff, right? And he's bald. And this is where we get the Oscar statue from. He was saying that mm-hmm. modern Egyptologists, they just simply say that this is a solar deity. And he was saying it's not a solar deity, it's a polar deity. So he has a section in his book literally called Solar versus Polar Worship. And so we live in this solar centric sort of world now. And so we don't have an understanding of this 
polar idea, which is why I feel like I need to talk about some of this stuff. And so I think a lot of things that were once northern or polar in nature uh, have now been attributed to solar symbolism, Palladian symbolism, and Syrian symbolism. That That's my personal take. Yeah, well, it's, it's really tricky because, well, uh, the, the the thing that comes to mind is um i actually have a book i almost feel like pulling it out it's called Please. i'm going to grab it hold on yeah go for it um i don't know if you've ever seen this book it's called the stars by h a ray oh no i don't think so i think so this guy h a ray i'm I forget which i think he was the illustrator or author of the curious george <laughs> yes I, like, I, I'm familiar with it now. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's like he illustrated all this stuff, but when I, and I, I haven't really dove deep into this book, but um, it's way more astronomical than just like astrological. I mean, astrology, you're, you, you're not looking at the stars most of the time, unless it's like a conjunction or a, a full moon or an eclipse. But like you said, you can only see half of the Zodiac at any given time. So um but yeah. with this, when he was describing the pole star, it made it really made a lot of sense um, because he used these. Yeah, okay, I'll I'll just flash this on the screen. But he did the, He's like a children's book author, and he's using the pole star nice. analogy with like an umbrella. Yep. And if you're turning the umbrella, the actual umbrella part is like the backdrop of the stars, but the pole of the umbrella represents like the pole star. Yeah. And yeah, it, it, like it's really kind of tricky these days with all like the light pollution and stuff to really have like that like ancient understanding that, you know, in certain times of the year, you see these constellations and certain times of the year you see other ones. And even just like the most basic one is um, you only see, in the northern hemisphere, you see Orion only really in the winter um, and then it kind of goes away for the summer. but the pole star just does not move at all and everything is kind of rotating. And even what you were, you were talking about um, Ursa major and Ursa minor. I mean, I've heard that those are kind of like where the swastika symbolism comes from because it's like they're angled. And then in each of the four seasons, they're being turned on that axis. So correct. Yeah, exactly. Symbolically, like it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm so you're saying that because I think even on your channel, I've seen you show imagery of Masonic <clears throat> art that had little clusters of seven stars. Are you saying those are Ursa Major, like the which is basically the Big Dipper, right? Yep, yeah, that's my personal opinion is that when you see seven star symbolism, I think the first thing, uh, once again, there's two different attributes that most people I think would come to. Um, and I don't, you know, in a way, it's just like, they're not wrong, you know, but uh, most people would either think that this is the seven stars of the Pleiades, or the seven traditional planets. And so there's a lot of artwork um, that shows seven dots, seven stars, you know, things like that. And uh, I think it has to do with the, uh, the Ursa Major constellation. And so once again, both of these constellations, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper has seven stars. And then Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper, also has seven stars. And the last star of Ursa Minor is the tip of its handle, which is actually literally the pole star. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we have seven days of the week, you know, seven colors of the rainbow, uh, traditionally seven chakras. You know, the number seven is, is a very magical number. And um, I think it has a lot to do with uh, the resonance of, of this place, the frequency of this place, the color spectrum, you know? And so I think that this is what's being baked into the chariot card, which is number seven. And so notice too, that number seven is the seventh letter of the alphabet. So you got the Masonic G there, you know? Um, and so uh, with the chariot card, you're dealing with a wheel, you know, the chariot wheel. And so you're dealing with the turning of heaven, the turning of heaven, which essentially 
is uh, symbolic of the stars revolving around that North Star. And even the Rider Waite chariot card, you know, he literally has a star on top of his head. And there's a canopy of stars above that star. And there's four Yeah, posts. that's what I was going to say. Yeah, because it, yeah. it's like he's under like a tent that has stars on it. And then there's a star on his head. And I, and um, the, the astrological association with that card is cancer. And yep. I always kind of didn't see that. I mean, I, I can see it as a cancer card, but I think of the chariot as very like forward moving, but um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on can how cancer fits in. Oh yeah, absolutely. For sure. I mean, so um, I put out a video about the keystone from Royal Arch Masonry. Yeah, I think I saw that. That was really interesting. <laughs> nice, nice. Thanks, man. Yeah, so I, I think it's fascinating too, you know. And this has been something I've been chewing on for, you know, a couple of years. And I felt like it was finally time just to kind of talk about it. And so when you look into Royal Arch Masonry, the main symbolism you're going to see are two pillars and then an arch that extends from one pillar to the other. And in the middle of that archway, there's a keystone. And essentially, my understanding with my research, and actually, after I posted that video, several Masons have reached out or commented and said that I was spot on. You know, so um, this is their understanding as well. But that, uh, that keystone is symbolic of cancer. And so it's at the very top of the archway. And if you position the zodiac so that cancer's at the top, you're showing, you know, the beginning of summer at the top. And then this is uh, opposite of Capricorn, which would be, you know, the beginning of winter. And then at the horizon point, you would see uh, Aries, the beginning of spring, and then Libra, the beginning of fall, right? And so this taps into this belief that we come through Cancer and exit through Capricorn. You know, uh, there's a lot of gateway symbolism when you start looking into the Zodiac. That's what I found. You know, I can make the case that there's a gateway between Taurus and Scorpio or Sagittarius and, you know, Gemini, as well as Cancer and Capricorn. You know, there's just, there's a lot of information out there. But um, my understanding is that the Babylonians were really firm in this belief that we come through what's called the gateway of man, which is Cancer, which, you know, when we come into this reality, we come through mom, you know? And so there's a lot of cancer symbolism built into that. There's the womb, you know, and just uh, the womb is kind of like a um, microcosm of the ocean, of the great ocean even. And so there's lots of watery symbolism with cancer. You can kind of look at it like this is when we get our chariot, which is like our vessel, you know, that we're going to travel through uh, this life with and everything else. And then we, once again, we exit through Capricorn. But their whole belief is that this keystone at the top of the arch, which is symbolically cancer, that this is where the light comes through. And so uh, to me, what they're kind of referencing symbolically is that this is actually the northern sky. And so uh, in some of their illustrations, they have the eye of God or the eye of providence, you know, the eye inside of the triangle, just above that arch, looking through that, that hole where the keystone would be shining light through it. And so uh, there's even chariot cards that, um, you know, the alternative name for the chariot card in certain decks is uh, Triumph of the Lord of Light or Lord of the Triumph of Light or something to that effect. But it's symbolic of this light coming through that hole. And um, yeah, I think when you start looking into a lot of these different signs, you're, you're, you start picking up North Star symbolism. You know, I feel like it's just kind of baked into the whole Zodiac uh, because it's what everything revolves around. And so uh, with certain signs, I have much better examples of how it's related to Northern symbolism and other signs. I'm still kind of looking for it. But my strong hunch is that they all somewhat are kind of in one way or another an interpretation of that. And so, um, yeah, the Freemasonic arch thing, I think when you start looking into some of their symbolism, you're going to start seeing North Star stuff kind of all over the place. So you'll see the seven stars a lot. You'll see the G a lot. Um, you know, it's, um, there's multiple examples going on over there. So I think they're well aware of what's going on with that. Not all Freemasons, not all lodges, you know, nothing like that. But I think if you really were to study some of the symbols and you got really into it, I think that that's what you would come across. So even the plumb line, you know, if you have like a weight, 
and uh and you're holding it from like a cord or a string or whatever when you're making uh, a building or whatever and you want to make sure that everything is perpendicular you know i've read in their work that that's symbolic of the axis mundi as well yeah i mean um it's really deep and um Something about like the Mason. Uh, so, okay. I kind of want to <laughs> ask you what you think about the Masons too, because I've seen your presentation on Instagram, you know, even j just what you were talking about of the Masonic keystone. Um, what's your perspective of the Masons from like a, I don't know if you consider yourself a conspiracy person, but from like a truther perspective, because honestly, so, so much like the first book that got me hooked on all of this stuff was, manly p hall the secret teaching of all ages oh which, same which just has all of that artwork and i think the artwork itself i as well as you am like a art artistic design type person and that's what like got me and when i even look at like the stuff that with like i don't see this as sinister i i'm sorry i just don't see like the vibe of it does not it seems natural and it seems normal or good but do you have any thoughts on like the perhaps nefarious nature of the masons especially from like a truth or, or like a conspiracy point of view yeah that's a great question um you know i've really softened my stance on it too to be honest and so i think it's really easy to buy into the scapegoating sort of aspect of it and say that they're the problem for all these different things and they're to blame and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I have no doubt that they um, have orchestrated events um, and that there is something to all of that. So I would never say that they, they haven't or that doesn't exist. But in my opinion, by and large, it's like, I, I don't think that there's a whole lot of nefarious stuff going on there as well. Um, I think in a lot of ways, they're just preservers of information. And I think that there are people on the outside of their system who know more about their system than people on the inside of it too. So uh, I think that you can learn a lot about it and you'd probably be surprised at how much you could learn about it versus someone who's actually going to the lodge and paying their dues and everything else. And so I have way more of a neutral sort of opinion about it. And so um, honestly, I guess symbolically, if anything, I'm kind of grateful that there is this stuff to analyze and decode. Um, and so I'm starting to think that kind of what I was talking about with, uh, you know, the afterlife stuff, I think part of what they're doing is, um, it's baked into, you know, their system. I think it's showing us how to die. And I think that that could potentially be a part of the major arcana too, is that this death, these death rites and how to transition accordingly and properly and everything else. I think that a lot of these mystery schools are actually teaching that. And I think there are some black magical groups that are also um, essentially pretty much talking about the same type of material. And so, um, you know, occultism, you know, right? The occult means hidden. And so what's like the most hidden thing about this reality? It's like what happens when we die, you know? And so I think that that is partly, you know, what is in the tradition is just like what happens upon death. And I think that we actually have a better idea of it than, than not, you know, I'm not claiming to, to say that I know exactly what happens, but I think that there are certain patterns and themes and, and things like that, that people have passed down for a very, very long time. And I think that the Masons in part are just part of this sort of lineage and whatever. So I don't scapegoat them. I also don't put them too high up on a pedestal either. Um, so I'm, I'm cool with them personally. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And even when you look at the histories of them and I think, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been doing a lot, I've been reading a lot of different books and talking to a lot of different people and, I think there might, I think just secret societies in general were kind of being, they were kind of being pushed forward really like from the Renaissance forward, or I guess the, and especially around the enlightenment. Mm. And I really get the sense that um, there was right hand and left hand path <laughs> versions of like everything, even, um, I mean, the founding of the United States of America how many of the founding fathers were Masons 
and it was like just like the the idea of being like illuminated or the enlightened or the enlightenment that was happening during that century um I don't know. It, it, it really seems like the, there was like a, there, cause I, I totally think that these groups and like have a lot to do with what we would think of as the new world order. Like I think there is, there are people in cahoots with one another doing things in secret, but the more I look into it, the more I, it seems like there is like a white lodge and a black lodge maybe. Sure. Um, and I'm wondering, you've mentioned it a couple of times in this conversation about, um, you're like, oh, some black magic groups do that. Could you uh, expand a little bit on like who you think they are or what you think they do? When yeah, you refer sure. To these black magic groups. Yeah, totally. Um, so, I guess just first off, too, that you know, I think that there's positive and negative right hand path sort of um, ideologies, and then I also think there's positive and negative left-hand path ideologies. And so, um, so when I say black magic, I'm not, once again, I'm not necessarily scapegoating anybody um, because I know there's people who are interested in left-hand path black magical methods that actually are doing stuff that I think a lot of people who are truthers or on the right path or whatever you want to say would not find wrong, but it's just kind of, it's just a different way of looking at things, you know? And so um, I'm kind of more, honestly, in a way, I'm kind of like an anthropological person, you know, where I'm just like, this is culture. This is what people are doing. You know, I'm not here to morally judge like what they're doing because they use a chicken in their ritual and they live, you know, whatever in the sticks or something like that. It's just like, they're going to do it regardless of whether or not uh, I have any say in the matter or whatever. So I'm very much more just kind of an observer with a lot of this stuff, I would say, personally. Um, but what I've come to understand is that there are a lot of groups that now, and I think they're a lot bigger than what people realize, there are groups that use black magical methods to tap into this northern gateway essentially is is my understanding because this is a tradition that has been passed down for a very very long time so what i'm talking about when i'm referencing northern symbolism and everything this is a tradition that goes way way back that's why it's a huge rabbit hole and that's why it's a game changer because it has legs it has history uh there's multiple books about this um, I've heard it referred to in multiple, many different ways as I've really started paying attention to it. So um, what I'm tapping into is something that is very, very old. And so uh, this Northern Gateway, my understanding is that there are groups who are trying or who do work with this, who work with the North Star. So as I said earlier, I don't know if I completed this thought, but some people look at the Northern Sky as heaven and some people look at it as essentially hell that it's the underworld. So there is that belief system that the Northern sky isn't heaven, like the stairway to heaven, but it's actually hell. So it's really fascinating that there's all of these different things sort of baked into it. Um, but I started getting curious about HP Lovecraft and I needed to figure out what was going on with HP Lovecraft. Why is he so popular? What's the deal? I knew that there were sort of occult connections with his work and um, I needed to just figure out what was going on. And once I found out that there was a Northern Sky connection with this, I was all in. I was just like, I have to figure everything out about what's going on here. You know, there's people who are way more into his literature than I am. But uh, essentially what I found out is that, and we actually did a show on Interverse. If people are really curious to learn more about H.P. Lovecraft and what I'm talking about right now, there's a show on Interverse that we did where we go all in on uh, the symbolic value of his lore and like what's going on there. And I kind of really just reveal my research and what I've come to find out. And uh, essentially my understanding is that he wrote his material. It took a while, but people finally realized that his pantheon that he created was sound, meaning that there were certain gods that represented certain symbols and that his pantheon was actually solid. There's a solid foundation to his pantheon. And I think any creator who starts creating this type of material, that's what they're really going for. So if you're a director and you're creating a universe, you want this universe to make sense. So you're probably gonna have certain archetypes in your universe, you know, uh, the hero and the villain and things like that, right? Um, well, people, 
kind of translated his work and said, you know what? He's just giving us an updated Sumerian pantheon. So the Sumerian gods of old are essentially, um, you know, updated with his pantheon. So he almost updated the pantheon for modern sensibilities. So there are groups out there today that use H.P. Lovecraft's work, including Cthulhu and his different gods and whatnot, and they're actually working with them on a black magical level. And what they are doing essentially is accessing this Northern gateway that I'm talking about. And if people want more information about that specifically, there's a book called The Gates of the Necronomicon by Simon. And literally on the cover are the seven stars of Ursa Major. That is like the main artwork. It's very obvious and it's very explicit. And it's very explicit in the book too, that what they're doing is they're tracking the night sky. And this is an older sky clock interpretation that they're tracking the night sky and they're waiting for the opportune time when Ursa Major is underneath the pole star. And they say that this is when the great bear hangs by its tail. And they believe that this was an opportune time to access that Northern gateway. And so they're using kind of a hybrid of, you know, this seven stepped ascension sort of concept along with, um, you know, uh, the Lovecraftian gods. And it's this hybrid sort of magical system um, that, like I said, has been created for modern sensibilities that they're using, you know, to do uh, astral work and travel work and whatnot. So that's like one example that when I said that earlier, that's what I was referencing. Yeah, that's really interesting. And even when you were even when you're just talking about how, I mean, if the northern, if the North Star is the pole, and the pole represents the um, the world tree, I mean, the world tree's roots go into the underworld. So, like, wouldn't that be the same pole that takes you there? I mean, yes. it, it makes sense. <laughs> it's a bridge. It's the it's the symbolic bridge that that has been referenced many many times over, and so when we as an example, let me just throw this out there. So it occurred to me one day that the postal service is essentially mercurial symbolism, and so Mercury once again is the guide of souls. He's a psychopomp. This is like one of the things that I'm tripping out on that I have been like looking into recently, and it just like blows my mind. But you know, psychopomp symbolism. Um, it, it's encoded in a lot of horse symbolism, chariot symbolism, boat symbolism, wheel symbolism. You know, it's this idea that when we go to the other side, that uh, we want either a vehicle or we want a guide to take us there, essentially. And Mercury is that deity. Mercury is that guy. He's that guy that'll take you from one place to the other. So he's a traveler. So he's the messenger of the gods, right? So this central pole or trunk or whatever, that's the bridge that he uses to go between realms, okay? And so it would make sense that the postal service is also encoding mercurial symbolism just by the nature of what all of this stuff represents, you know? Um, we call it postage, and it's the postal service. It's that central post. It's that central pillar that the uh, messenger of the gods uses to go up and down uh, between the realms. So uh, that's what they're referring to. So when we think of post and, and postage and everything, it's that central post. It's the world axis or axis mundi. Yeah, that's, that's so fascinating because it's uh, even, I mean... <laughs> just the ba the north pole the the all of the the symbolism i've never thought about the caduceus as being the north pole but that makes sense too um yeah i wanted to, i wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on even beyond this uh talk about the north and the northern the north star the northern heavens like the north I'm wondering what your thoughts are, your understanding is of just the origins of all of these symbolic symbolic um, images or, or traditions or anything. Like mm -hmm. how far do you think it goes back? And do you have any thoughts on just, you know, this the origins of all of this information? And do you think that there is sort of an untainted original mm -hmm. doctrine or 
or something that had everything figured out, everything, you know, organized that over time got maybe dissipated? Right, right. That's a great question. You know, um, I don't, you know, I think it's baked into nature. I think that's the original doctrine. I think there's even something called the doctrine of signatures. I'm not sure if you've ever heard about it, but it's essentially, it's this idea that, you know, uh, plants symbolically look like what they do and kind of yeah. like what, what they do to the human body as an example. So it's kind of well known, like walnuts kind of look like brains, you know, and it turns out they're really good for the brains. You know, uh, they say that figs are good for the testicles and they kind of look like testicles. You know, uh, there's certain plants like uh, my girlfriend's an herbalist. So uh, she has really helped me understand a lot of this type of stuff. And so we very much bridge that gap together. She brings a lot of herbal information. She's interested, uh, you know, in alchemy too, uh, certain types of alchemy like spagyrics and things like that. She makes a lot of her own uh, products and creations and everything else. And so, um, you know, herbalism is just like a part of our life and it's something that we talk about. And the doctrine of signatures, when she introduced that to me, I was like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense, you know? And so we started figuring out the different doctrine of signature sort of associations with everything. Um, but I think nature in and of itself, you know, when you actually start paying attention to how plants, you know, uh, are designed, if you want to use that word, and how they operate, I think that that's where you're going to find a lot of secrets. So as an example, I just have to say that, you know, I've been looking at a lot of flowers recently that we have in our garden. And I have some flowers right here on my desk. And it just occurred to me, you know, literally within the last few days, it, it kind of now is very obvious to me, actually, is that um, a lot of flowers have that stem. And at the very top of the stem, you have that flower that opens up and you have these petals, you know, this is symbolic of the northern symbolism that I'm talking about. Every stem, every trunk is symbolic of uh, the North Pole. This is why everything is designed the way it's designed. You know, it's almost like this fractal sort of concept where uh, the original sort of creation is emanated in everything else. It's a copy of it, you know, in a lot of ways. It's a representation of it. And so um, I'm starting to see just the correspondence between everything that I'm proposing right now and just the natural world. And it's just like, I, I went on a hike before we started talking and there was this really nice uh, overlook sort of cliff thing that we have not too far from here. And I'm just hanging out and I live in the Pacific Northwest and there are thousands and thousands of trees around me, you know, completely covered. And I'm like, look, there's like hundreds of miles of trees around here, millions of trees around me, but yet they're all symbolic of that northern pole. You know, they're all symbolic of that axis mundi, of the world pillar. You know, why would this design be replicated in all of the trees, essentially all over the world? I know there's lots of variations with trees. Some are curvier, some are shorter, some are, some are taller, you know, the leaves, you know, there's a million variations, but they all follow this one essential design, which is that essentially roots go underground, there's a central trunk, and then branches fan out, you know, and if anyone has ever studied the Taurus field, they'll know the symbolic relationship between the Taurus field and the tree. Because if you just cut a Taurus field in half, which looks like a donut, essentially, excuse me, you're going to see pretty much a tree, you know. So the middle part of the Taurus field is known as, um, I believe it's the hyperbola, you know, but it's like this central trunk or gateway, you know, it's where energy comes out of and returns to, comes out of and returns to, you know. The Taurus field essentially is... Um, is Northern symbolism, in my opinion, the way I tend to interpret it and break it down. It's the same thing. And so I don't know if there's necessarily a, a doctrine, but I think there's symbols. I think there's symbols that actually encode and bake into it all of the stuff that I'm talking about. But it's just whether or not, you know, uh, you have the lens to see that or if you've done that kind of research or whatever. Uh, but I will say what I am coming across now is that if there's a polar northern deity, it is Mercury. It's Mercury, Hermes, Thoth. So, and all of the gods that associate with that, I think are very much in line with what I'm talking about. So um, that's gonna be something that I'm going to expand on at some point down the road that um, if, you know about, if you know about mercurial symbolism, 
you know, you're going to start seeing um, how it overlaps with the Axis Mundi and everything else. So um, that's a fantastic question, though. Um, I have read books that are specifically about this. Um, and I'm happy to name them if you want or whatever. But uh, I think that it's almost like this understanding, I feel like, is pretty intuitive. I feel like in a lot of ways, if we were left to our own devices, I think some of this stuff would become a little bit more apparent. Yeah. And the, the next question that comes to mind with, I mean, everything you just said was um, fascinating. The, so what I'm getting at is like with, with your page, with the things you do, with this information, the fact that it's in nature, the fact that it's right in front of us, all you have to do is look up. All you have to do is take a walk and look at plants. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're human. And through, through this occultism, this hidden stuff, we're, we're studying just the nature of creation and the nature of this world and how things work. And my question is like, what do you do with that information or, or what, what is your approach to the seeking of this information, the sharing of this information um, in terms of just kind of like your own spirituality or your own life's purpose? Because let me tell you, we haven't crossed into like the Christian versus new age or the Christian versus occult or the Abrahamic versus the pagan. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people are knocking the occult these days, sometimes myself. Um, but it's like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, this is true. But it's almost just like, now what? Once we get all the understanding, how do we use it? Or what, how, do, how do we apply occultism in a way that's not evil? I guess is my question. <laughs> oh, awesome question. Um, personally, I think that if you're not internalizing this stuff, then I think you're doing it the wrong way. And so if you're always looking for external validation, external saviors via gurus, priests, you know, uh, flavor of the month type teachers. You know, I think that's one thing that a lot of people do right now is they have like one YouTube guy or one podcast person or one social media influencer or whatever. And they're like, oh, I'm all about this person this month. And then they kind of like, you know, they move on, you know, and then they find someone else and then it's something else. But they never internalize the information, you know. I think uh, conspiratainment, you know, and kind of like uh, spirituality as like an entertainment sort of genre now. Or rec I call it recreational because a lot of it is just like, whoa. There you go. You know, it's fun, but yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 you're totally right. It's all recreational, you know? Yeah. And so it's like people are welcome to do what they want. And I think we have to be recreational too. You know, yeah. I like, you know, movies and I like music and I like, you know, entertainment and I like to veg out and not really like have my brain turned on or whatever. I think that's important, actually. I think there's a lot to be said about that, you know. Um, but I would say that uh, these sort of teachings have to be internalized, you know. And so um, I would say the best path forward is literally just like working on yourself, knowing yourself and, um, trying to understand who you actually really are and trying to resolve some of these um, hidden traumas that we have, you know, these invisible wounds. And so I think that you don't go through this reality unscathed. I think just being born here, I think is traumatic, to be honest. I think that might be one of the first core wounds here. And so you're separated from your mother, from the, the confines of her womb and everything else. And so, and, and the way we do it too, in the modern world, you know, it's completely nuts in my opinion. Um, so I don't think you go through this life unscathed. I think correspondences are cool. If you know my channel, if anyone checks it out at some point, you'll know that I love all of the symbolic correspondences, you know, but I think one of the things though, that I really should remind people, um, you know, this is more of like a responsibility sort of thing is that these correspondences are fine. Memorizing them is fine. I think that there's things to be, um, you know, uh, brought forth from doing that. I think that there's fruits within trying to figure some of these things out. But if you're not internalizing it and you're not actually using it to do kind of the great work, which is inner work, which I think a lot of things 
have to do with um, a lot of these lessons are about uh, transmuting things. It's like the alchemical process, turning lead into gold symbolically. You know, if you're not actively trying to find your sacred center or your true north, um, if you're not making this correspondence as within, so without, then I think that you're kind of missing uh, part of the whole entire thing here. So as an example, I was very, very interested in conspiracy theories for a very long time. So I've gone through all the rabbit holes, you know, for the most part, I'm sure there's some that I skipped. But for the most part, you know, I was in that lane for a very long time. Um, I try not to get triggered with any kind of information. I try and just like, you know, shelve it, and maybe it'll be useful down the road. And so uh, I was very much interested in everything from like, you know, secret society stuff to like UFO stuff and whatever. Um, but at a certain point, I kind of realized that, you know, at, you have to, if you start questioning things around you, but you never question yourself, that's kind of a problem. That's kind of an issue. And so if you're pointing fingers at everybody else around you or the things around you, groups around you, but you don't point fingers at yourself, to me, that's kind of an issue. So in my opinion, like questioning one thing leads to questioning everything, which should lead to questioning yourself. And so now, as an example, I'm more concerned about the lies that I tell myself than the lies that people tell me. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. And part of the reason I bring it up is because, uh, you know, I, well, I was raised with uh, Christian religion. I was raised Catholic and, um, when I, I, I go through waves of being interested in the esoteric and then I go, then I hit a bottom where I'm just like, I don't care about astrology. I'm an astrologer and I, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, I don't give a fuck what the stars say. And, yeah. but that doesn't last either. Then it comes back up and I'm enthusiastic and I'm like, yeah, let's go. Like, let's talk about it. Um, but kind of recently I, I, and just to piggyback off what you were saying, um, things in my person, things in my life were kind of going downward. And I noticed that at that point, I was, when I questioned the, the, my, my study of the occult and actually kind of turned towards, I turned to the opposite end of things, which is like Christianity. Mm. Um, when external circumstances are hard and I'm like, Shh. And, and it's like when, when, when hard times come, you're kind of like, did I, what did I do to like, fuck this up was it because of all the magic stuff i was like tied up in mm -hmm. and stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah. um but i i what i was getting at earlier was like the the idea of the great work because that seems so good and it's there's there's like this like d duality between abrahamic and pagan or christianity and the occult um but i think if you go really far back even in the masonic information that it's like all from the same source and that it's not, it's just reality. But I, I guess to, to counter what you said, um, you know, and, and I'm just wondering in general, what you think about this, like with new age and with the occult and with the esoteric, do you think that is very like, like you were saying, like inwardly focused and from a critic's perspective, perhaps selfish as opposed to Christianity, which is like supposed to be like, Oh, I give like I give up everything to God. I give everything up to Jesus. I'm not I'm nothing. It's not about me. It's about helping others. Do you have any thoughts on just that duality? Because I go, I definitely yeah. go back and forth, and I'm just like, what What do you do? Like, <laughs> you, you can't not do both. Almost. Yeah. No. You're You're absolutely right. And so I do have thoughts about that. And I would say personally, the way I tend to look at it is almost like what I said about the left hand path and right hand path is that there's people who are helping other people for all of the wrong reasons. You know, they're very much concerned with other people, the community, uh, the tribe, this and that. That's cool. Um, you know, from just like a surface level, that sounds fantastic and noble. But we know that there's people, there's priests, there's churches, there's gurus who are miserable, doing terrible things, you know, uh, but it's because they have, you know, uh, that identification that people like that they're going to be, you know, they think that they're trustworthy or whatever. And so there's a lot of people giving their energy away to some of these people. And uh, I would say that, you know, one of the um, sayings that I used to say all the time was, uh, 
the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you know? So there's a lot of people who have good intentions to help other people, you know, but they have yet to even help themselves, you know? So if you have yet to help yourself and you have yet to kind of, um, like I said, heal some of these core wounds or invisible wounds, um, you might be helping people or you might just be enabling people, you know, because you haven't done that kind of work yet. So I would say that there's people who are helping others and they're doing it for all of the wrong reasons. There's others who are doing it for all the right reasons. And therefore too, there's people who are on this individualistic path. They're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You know, there's people who uh, would follow this kind of ideology and it's actually more detrimental to them and even maybe people around them too. But there's also people on that path um, that I think are doing it for all of the right reasons, you know. And so what I would say personally is that I think that this inner path, I would even say it's the path of the hermit. You know, I think of the hermit card, number nine, which is ruled by Virgo, which is ruled by Mercury, which kind of gets into some of the stuff I'm talking about. But uh, if you go through that phase, the hermetic phase, and you really take a deep look at yourself one, you get closer to the universe. That, that's how you tap into the universe. I'm not telling people go to the North Star, you know, or try and go to the Northern, um, you know, part of the world or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Because there are people who think that actually, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. This was something going on a few years ago where there was like a click of the internet that got into some of this information and they physically wanted to go to the North Pole and you know look into like what's going on there i think there's a lot of interesting mysteries potentially related to the north too which is kind of like a separate topic or whatever but i'm all about going inward because i think if you go inward and once again you find your true north your north star your sacred center that's how you tap into the cosmos that's how you tap into the universe you know it's not by externally traveling to the cosmos or universe it's actually by going within but as you do that, as you go within, and if you're doing it the right way, in my opinion, you are going to be that much better of an ally or an advocate or a friend or warrior, not only for yourself and for like your immediate tribe, but for like the extended tribe as well. So it's like the people who are the most helpful people, I think, have done that kind of work. You know what I mean? And so I think if you do that kind of work, I think you're just better off and you can then therefore too lead by example and you'll know how to help other people. So one quick example I'll give, uh, there's a teacher online. He's been around for years, very unsavory, but that's one of the reasons why I love him too. His name is Brother Panic. And uh, he is really plugged, in, plugged into the black conscious community. And he has been for a very, very long time. And he says that when he first started teaching that he would tell people like, oh, it's all about helping, you know, your brother and your sister and the community and this and that and whatever. And he said that he did that for like a couple of years, a few years. And then at a certain point, he changed his tune because he realized that there's a better way. And he started focusing on the individual and helping yourself and doing that inner work, which is the hardest work, by the way, you know, that is the path least traveled, which is why it's necessary. And so he said, as he changed his tune and changed his message and started saying like, no, you got to do the inner work. That's what it's all about. It's about your psychology and your experience and, um, you know, your spiritual development and growth and everything else. And, uh, you know, the millions of lessons kind of built into that. He was saying that then he noticed that he actually started helping the community way, way more once that was his message. When his message was help the community, help everyone else, blah, 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 he said it just literally was not as effective. And so when you focus on the individual and individuation, I think that's really where the, where the real uh, power is. Yeah, that's a great answer um, because, again, um, I'm just, I'm, I'm the host of this show. So I just project my shit during my interviews. <laughs> but like, if people are listening to this show, they're probably on some sort of esoteric path one way or the other, or some yeah. in, inner path. And um, yeah, the, because the, the biggest critique of a lot of the esoteric stuff is it's just like, you're like, so self involved, like, you're just like, and, and um 
I, but, but when I think about what actually comes forward from doing that work, I mean, I, I'm an astrologer and I'm into this stuff almost not by choice. I don't know if you resonate with that. Like, not by choice because like I'm so into it or I'm like so drawn to it that I can't even like help myself to an extent. Like I resonate with when I picked up uh, the, the secret teaching of all ages for the first time, like I burned through that book and I've it's so there's, 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 it's like a force of nature, you know, and it's almost like yeah. you, you're going to do it. Um, I I'm, I'm curious if you have thoughts on whether, everyone should be doing this or whether it's kind of reserved for just certain people like are, are certain people ready for this information or for this journey or not <laughs> that's a great question too i mean on one hand i think of people uh anyone pursued uh these types of uh methods of, of you know the inner work type stuff and whatever I think that they would benefit from it, but I do more so on my day to day, um, sort of just like the way I do things. I, I tend to think that not everyone's ready for it. And I tend to think that not everyone here is for that. And so I don't basically try and convert anybody to anything anymore. I think, uh, when you first get into conspiratorial information, at least one of my hunches, uh, was to want to tell everybody and wake people up, so to speak, you know, to all of these different things that are kind of going on. And I'm not so much like that anymore. I don't really do that. I was never really crazy about that to begin with. Um, but I'm way more reserved with who I share my information and knowledge with. If people like it, they can follow my channel. If they don't like it, they don't have to, right? Um, but yeah, no, I think there's a very wide spectrum of people here. And I don't think we're all, they are all created equal. I mean, we have basically people living, you know, on earth that are like ascended master, you know, type people, in my opinion, you know, and then there's also people who are essentially empty vessels, you know, like literally. And so I'm not a person that just thinks that we're all kind of created equal. I think that we have a huge, huge wide thing going on here. And so um, some people literally are closer to angels and some people symbolically are closer to being demons, you know? And so I don't think that they're all ready to do that, nor would I expect that they would want to do that. And so I don't think that everybody can be saved, but I don't know if that's the deal here. I don't know if that's um, what's supposed to happen. I think that personally, another belief I think things are balanced here. I think things seek an equilibrium. So, um, you know, the last couple of years was pretty crazy for a lot of people. And um, a lot of people were just wondering, like, how could this happen? Like, what's going on? Things are so messed up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, cause and effect. It's like, look at the world we lived in leading up to what happened a couple of years ago. And it makes sense that something like this would happen. Um, and that it would make sense that what has happened since is just going on. So when I see the craziness of the world, um, I tend to see it as a um, cause and effect sort of thing that this is happening. This was built on, you know, decades or hundreds of years of events in history and, you know, uh, psychological programming and, you know, things of that sort. So I tend to look at the world and I don't see the world as being broken. I actually see it as being like what it's supposed to be. Totally. Um, it makes me beg the question though, <laughs> like now that we've kind of crossed into this territory of like why we're here, certain people are not born equally. Certain people are more advanced on the path. What is your idea of like, do you have a, like a, a model that includes like reincarnation? Do you have a model? Like, what do you think we're, is going on with the human soul given all of this information about the occult? given all this stuff that's like you see it out in the world, you see it within yourself, you discover the, the stuff within yourself. Like, what are we doing here? Is this like a multi lifetime great work that we're all at totally different levels of? Or do you have any ideas of just like what we're doing? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes I'm like, what am I doing right now? <laughs> sure, that's a great question, honestly. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that, yes, I do think that there, this is a reincarnation system in so many words. 
And I think that the northern sky, as I've been saying, plays a bigger part in that than what you know most realize. And I think that what we're doing here is that we're essentially, we're travelers. And so one of the things I've been saying lately is that, you know, it's really common for people to say men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be true exoterically. I think at face value that, that there's something to that. And so I don't dismiss it outright. But I think what's actually perhaps more accurate is to say that men are from Mercury, women are from Venus. So if you notice the symbol for Venus, it's a circle with a cross underneath. You just add horns to the circle up top and you have the symbol for Mercury. And so this is a belief that kind of goes back that I've read before that Mercury is the true partner of Venus, actually, not Mars. And so I think that's a really interesting thing to kind of chew on. But once again, Mercury is known as a psychopomp. He's the guide of souls. And if we're more mercurial and he's the messenger of the gods, I think really our, the whole entire deal here is that we travel. We travel internally through our emotions. Notice that the word motion is in emotion. And then notice that ocean is within the word motion. You know, so we can travel internally. You know, so we can go and we can almost move mountains, basically, you know, um, on a transcendental sort of level, on a emotional, psychological level. We can be moved. We say that when we're emotional, we've been moved, you know, but you're not physically going anywhere. Um, and then notice, too, that some chariot cards, they're essentially motionless. They're immobile. They're not actually going anywhere. That's one of the secrets with the chariot card. A lot of older chariot cards, they're showing the chariot completely still. There's no intention of this chariot going anywhere because it's an internal movement. And I kind of uh, relate this once again back to the heavens and the North Star. It's this internal movement, just like a wheel internally moves or a top you know, moves kind of like into itself or the yin yang symbol kind of moves into itself or even the, uh, the cancer symbol, it's moving into itself sort of thing, right? Um, I almost think of like a, a whirlpool or something like that. So I think we're, we're built to move. I think a lot of human symbolism has to do with this journeying thing. We call it the path of the fool for a reason. It's the first card, it's number zero, you know? Um, and so I think what the deal is here is that we come here there's a lot of internal movement. I do think it is something of a, uh, of a school, if you will, where you learn lessons and, you know, um, you give it a go and see how you do. And then I think when we transition, I do think we transition to the other side. And I think it's more of an etheric sort of plane. Um, my personal opinion is when you look in the night sky, I think you're looking, they call it the heavens for a reason. You know, um, we have this nuts and bolts, physical, tangible, material way of looking at what's happening up there. But I actually think it's probably more mystical um, and spiritual in nature than it is actual like physical 3D material stuff. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out like as much as I love astrology and constellations and stuff, I'm like, what the hell is going on up there? You know, I still have a lot of questions, a lot of big questions too. But uh, I do think that we live in the physical reality. I think we die. I think we go to the other side. I think you experience you know, uh, what it's like on that side. And then I think you come back here. And so you're literally just going back and forth between these realms. And one lifetime seems like a long time. But my guess is that on the grand scheme of things, it's probably a really quick blip. Uh, but I also think when you live here that we live in this paradoxical sort of thing. So it's like on one hand, one moment goes by in a flash, but also one moment can last a lifetime sort of thing. So it's really weird. I think that, um, you know, a uh, part of the human condition is the fact that we're like spiritual creatures, but also physical creatures as well. And so I think that we have a lot of kind of like schizoid opinions, or uh, I think we kind of battle with that in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just kind of my personal opinion. And so and I think that the highway or the bridge that you exit out of is the same one that you come through, which which is at the northern uh, portion of the sky. Yeah, that's, that's a really good answer to that. And um, it's, it just, it makes you think about all of these things. And um, just really, for me, um, especially just because I've been, like, I cracked open the secret teaching of all ages in like 2010. Okay, So I'm basically almost at 12 years. Uh, and it's funny enough, I'm in my Jupiter return, which is a 12 year cycle, but I'm really looking back at it. I'm like, 
I mean, there's a lot of stuff that lives within me now. Like a lot, even I haven't really um, focused a lot on the tarot in a while, but I spent a long time learning that and that stuff really is internalized and it really is. I mean, the thing you said about the, the chariot card makes a lot of sense because I was even just thinking, you know, so many of the cards in tarot, when I think of chariot, I want us to be like fast moving forward. Mm -hmm. But really, I think of like, you know, like the knight of swords for that. It's like char, it's like coming mm. at you. The the chariot is like these clunky sphinxes and like a freaking flimsy tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that, uh, that guy is not speeding through anything, really. It's it, but but it even has the wheel. I'm talking about the rider weight. It has the little wheel in the front, and it's really all about that wheel. Um, and astrology is completely about that wheel too. Um, so yeah, it, it's really mind blowing. And you would think that all of this info, like uh, all this information, does teach you about the nature of things and the nature of reality and nature of yourself. So it's just it's. It is the great work, but so much stuff gets dragged these days by people just being like, oh, no, that's just the occult. Oh, no, it's just black magic. Oh, it's the devil. And I'm I'm not safe from it. Sometimes I think that. Even I have a freaking show about this stuff. So <laughs> it, I, I, I do yeah. jump back and forth, and I, I like to – my main thing is these days I'm trying to, like, bridge the gap between – a lot of different sides because I think a lot of us are on the same page. A lot of us occulty people are on the exact same page as many Christian people and have less in common with the mainstream occulty people because a lot of them are just like woke beyond belief. And then And then a lot of the Christians don't get along with the mainstream Christians because they're hypocritical beyond belief. So it's just an interesting time we're in and um, it's good to talk to you um, about all this stuff. Cause literally your, your page is inspiring and it's really well done. It's really, um, it straight up reminds me of like that initial draw that I got when I first cracked open the secret teaching of all ages and looked at all the artwork. And it's like, no, this is like, it, it feels resonant, like beyond lifetimes, first of all. And it feels familiar big time so uh that's awesome yeah. yeah thanks for saying that um that means a lot and i'll just say too dude the occult world is not exactly what you think it is for most people who are getting into it so it's just i'm skeptical about it all man and so for me personally there is some absolutely because i just want to be clear there are some absolutely nefarious not great things happening in that world I don't do, I'm not a ritual uh, magician person. I don't do ceremonial magic. I don't do other people's rituals or spells. That's not my deal. I'm not into cursing. I'm not into hexing. I, I don't do any of that stuff. That's not my thing, you know? And um, the occult world is uh, co-opted. And so, I mean, I don't know any other way of putting it. It's, it's been co-opted and there are things going on there that you do not want to be a part of. I'm not saying all the lodges are like this or the mysterious, mysterious, uh, the mystery schools are like this, but there is just a lot of things happening in those communities uh, that'll turn your stomach, man. And so I don't, um, I don't advocate that this whole community is just like, you know, um, on doing the right thing or on the up and up or like checks out or anything like that so that's all there's a whole dark underbelly to the occult world to the esoteric world but there's a whole underbelly to the exoteric world as well and so it's just like i think keeping both of those things in mind is something that i try and and do and just kind of realize so i'm not part of any group like that personally because i think you basically um just to your point you have all the right in the world to be skeptical of what's going on here yeah totally and um yeah it's it, it's it's a slippery slope because um even when you're talking about like you don't do magic you don't do stuff i mean a lot of people are just learning this stuff to try to do magic and not know how that works when you just fuck it's it's literally fuck around and find out and then you find out usually the hard way and then you like pump the brakes but 
I think yeah. a lot of people get burned um, by exactly. just thinking like, oh, I'm going to, you know, learn the whole, t- the whole tarot so I could like cast better spells or something. Um, I don't know if I would recommend that either. Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, there's a lot of people that do things. And I feel as though maybe you might be prompting me right now, but I feel as though um, it might be worthwhile for me to finally release a video where I talk about some very basic, in my personal opinion, like uh, do's and don'ts with this type of stuff. Because it's a lot of the younger people who are just finding out about this stuff. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, I have the most traction on TikTok. And so, yeah, so I have a lot of people that are pretty young watching my stuff, you know, and I've gotten, um, you know, I've booked sessions with people who are really young. And so they're like half my age, you know, and I'm just like, wow, this is kind of crazy that you're interested in this stuff. And you have the internet, you know, at your disposal on your phone to watch as many videos as you want. And I've seen what people are talking about with astrology and the tarot, you know, on social media. And most of it is just not how I personally roll. And so I do think that there needs to be a conversation about some of this stuff because I think that it could just work against you. Essentially, it's a tool just like any other tool. So uh, you can use it in the wrong way and end up shooting yourself in the foot. Absolutely. Yeah. And even with astrology, I mean, I, f- I think about that when I'm putting out forecasts, cause I put forecasts out every week and most of the people I talk to are like, Dan, I take it with a total grain of salt. Like it's entertaining. It's just like a, a thing to think about, Yeah, but that you don't want people to be like, Oh my God, it's two days away from this alignment. What am I to expect? Like blah, 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 blah. Um, and I made a wall calendar this year and I kind (laughs) of, it's not that I am at this point really considering like stepping back from being an astrologer, but I think I feel a lot more comfortable just being like, Hey, here's a wall calendar. It tells you all the glyphs and all the information. I'm not going to tell you what it means. You have to figure that out on your own and you have to draw a jump to your own conclusions. But I do worry sometimes when I'm like, you know, oh, hey, it's like a blood moon square Saturn opposite Mars. Um, Yeah, that's gonna be really bad. Because it is. I mean, it's supposed to be bad. It's the symbolism is inherent, it's going to be difficult, or it's going to be rough. But again, the other thing too, with astrology is like, people just, you know, people are having bad days all the time, and great days all the time at the same time. And the stars don't totally dictate what is going to happen to everyone, but the stars are like a narrative and it's whether or not, it's like, how, how hard are you going to try to connect your narrative with the the celestial narrative? Or do you even want to do that? Do you just want to live your life and not think about it? Um, So it's, it's definitely complicated, but. It is. It is. And I'll just say one thing regarding tarot. This is just my own personal thing, but I feel as though it could be extended to divination in general. I feel as though with the tarot, I, I think it's better used as a way to check in with current energies and past yeah. energy. I think it's better used as a reflective tool or a tool to check in with the now versus a tool to forecast ahead and see what's going on, you know? And so that's one of the things for me, but when you're young and you just get into this, that's like one of the first things you want to do is, yeah. is you know, uh, see what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. It's super, super interesting. But um, we're, we kind of went a little over time. Hopefully I'm not keeping you too long, but. Um, oh no, dude, you're all good. Um, I was going to see if you have any like final thought. Um, what I want to lean towards is just like the state of things. Um, you know, I'm always kind of checking in like, okay, we went through this whole frick. I mean, talk about the great work. Like we, the humanity is the great work and they're, they're pushing us through all these different um, scenarios. So with, with what you study and what you present um, with all of that taken into consideration, do you have any final thoughts on kind of like where we're at um, <laughs> as humans and what the state of the world is right now and any advice for, for that? Yeah, sure. You know, what has happened over the last couple of years um, has been really revealing. And I think that that's kind of what's going on here. Personally, with a lot of people that I know in my life 
and seemingly on line two and what have you, a lot of people's true colors came out, in my opinion. And a lot of people's like the hands that they were dealt kind of came out. And I think that there was this big expose that happened. That's how I interpreted it. And uh, I'm grateful for what happened. I'm grateful for the last two years, man. I mean, I honestly, I'm in a better position now than I was uh, before everything. I used this time to my advantage. Um, and so I think that it's always the time to do work. But I think especially now, I, I feel like uh, addressing, you know, uh, loose ends, loose cords, I think always makes sense. And so in a lot of ways, my, my advice probably might stay the same for a really long time because uh, it's, it's been the same, you know, this whole entire time, to be honest. But I really just think now is, is the time to, um, you know, address those things in your life that need to be addressed and to kind of in a way quote unquote I wouldn't say take care of business that kind of sounds cold or it kind of sounds a little harsh or something like that but I just think that there's uh, momentum with people who are choosing to do that and so I think if you're pursuing a passion if you're doing something new I think if uh, if something's nagging at you because you haven't done x y or z I think you should totally do it and I'm really of the opinion that, you know, when you do something courageous that's in line with your uh, true authenticity, with your true north, you know, the universe kind of conspires in your favor. So I say, you know, go for it. There's no better time than now um, to kind of, you know, symbolically like chase your dreams in a lot of ways. So that's kind of my personal advice right now. I'm usually very optimistic with things. And so I've been criticized with that <laughs> with certain people that I know. But that's how I feel. And I feel like, um, you know, you are on the right path. So if there's something that you have yet to do, um, that, you know, you've had starts and stops with something, you know, whether it be like personal work or whatever, that's totally cool. And it's okay. You know, you are on the right path because this is the path that you're on, you know? And so instead of like regretting or wishing or woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, in my opinion, it's just like, uh, accept kind of what was and like move forward from there and like learn the lessons and just like continue progressing and stuff. But, you know, I always bring it back to, uh, you know, your inner self and your inner journey. So that's what I think that, you know, I, I just see multiple things kind of going on out there that I'm like, man, I'm so glad I'm doing this and not falling for what's happening out there, you know? And I think that that's when you can get easily duped and sucked into certain agendas and programs and ways of thinking. Uh, it's when you don't have your true North sort of identified, it's much easier for you to be led astray. Um, so yeah, so that's generally just my advice. That's really good advice. And, um, yeah, really appreciate all of the wisdom you've shared. And especially even for me, because like, you know, the past, I mean, technically the past two episodes I put out had a more Christian leaning to them. And then um, this is like a nice, this is a nice more occulty leaning <laughs> to lean back. Because really, I think like the the middle path really is... Um, the goal, I guess, between the right hand, and the left hand path that we were talking about. And um, all of this stuff, all the stuff that you post about is like totally a part of me for the tw past 12 years, you know, um, and I, I just am identifying, you know, when I go through that period, the, these little bumps in the road, where something else is, is distracting me or giving me doubts or giving me fear. And then it's like, well, you know, why am I been doing all this like astrology and es esoteric stuff? Like maybe this is why I'm having a bad time, but I don't think it's that. I think it's really just, um, you know, it, it's all self-reflection and the self-reflection I'm doing is kind of like, yeah, external things like lead to challenges, but um, don't blame the occult or astrology or something or don't like like a knee jerk jump out of it into something different you know just because um the going gets a little rough so um, right right yeah no i hear you man and i would just say one last thing uh i i feel as though you're talking about reflection and I actually did a show about mirror symbolism on a different podcast mm -hmm. and uh there's a lot of reflective 
mirror-like qualities to the North Star and to all of the Northern symbolism that I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, your inner world is going to reflect on the external world. So if you're all messed up on the inside, if you're confused, you have anxiety or whatever, it's amazing how there's this parallel between what's happening internally, obviously, and what's happening externally as well. So I just yeah. wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, totally. Well, this was an awesome chat and I, uh, I could probably keep going, but we should probably end it now. So Mario, thanks again for coming on and for everyone listening. Um, can you share where they can find you online? Yeah, of course. So you can find me at symbolicstudies.com. I'm on Instagram. It's symbolic.studies. I do have a Patreon too. It's patreon.com slash symbolicstudies. And if people are interested in a tarot reading, they can reach out. I also do study sessions and consultations. It's been really cool meeting all sorts of people. Uh, they want me to analyze their dreams or look at their artwork, read their poetry, talk about projects that they have going on. People have wanted me to do deep dives on certain symbols and myths and whatever. So um, if there's anything you think I could help you out with, uh, just let me know. But everything's at symbolicstudies.com. Awesome. Yeah, I, I highly recommend... I mean, just the inner, uh, the uh, Instagram page, because, um, you know, you're putting out like reels and videos that have like narration. It's really good quality. And really, from my perspective, a lot of the Zodiac stuff, I mean, if you've been doing astrology for as long as I have, you think you've seen it all, but I'm like, oh shit, I've never seen this comparison or I've never seen this analysis. So it's, it, you know, for someone like me who like thinks they know everything <laughs> you're <laughs> teaching me new stuff all the time. So highly recommend it. Um, awesome. Well, yeah, thanks again for coming on today. This was great. Absolutely, dude. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care.